This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, missing senior. Search teams continue to scour the New Glasgow area for a 73-year-old who hasn't been seen since Monday. More training wanted. Some early childhood educators say they are ill-prepared to work with kids with disabilities. And derelict buildings. CBRM wants provincial help to clean up unsightly properties. Building clouds tonight and a few showers in the mix overnight and through Thursday, but some wetter weather rolling in for Friday. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. The search continues at this hour for a missing elderly woman in Pictou County who hasn't been seen in more than two days. 73-year-old Adair Townsend has Alzheimer's and her family is extremely worried about her. We get more on this report from the CBC's Paul Palmiter. A government helicopter was in the air this morning trying to find a woman who has not been seen since Monday around noon. 73-year-old Adair Townsend is described by police as having a mild case of Alzheimer's and is known to take regular walks on her own. We called numerous uh, search and rescue teams from throughout the province. Uh, we also included our resources as uh, fire departments that had uh, boat capabilities for searching. Townsend is about five foot two. She was last seen wearing glasses, a bluish gray coat, and black Doc Martens. A command center has been set up at Trenton Park, which was closed today. It's one of the areas where Townsend was reported to have been seen. That's seven kilometers from where she was last seen on Monday on this New Glasgow street. This afternoon, the helicopter lifted off near the Pictou County solid waste site. Townsend's son declined an interview but said images from security cameras at the site showed his mother walking near the scale house. The search is now focused in that area, with ground searchers and police dog teams scouring by land and the helicopter by air. Police have issued regional alerts and are asking people in the area to check their properties, including sheds, garages and security cameras. Public's information that we receive is crucial to the ongoing investigation. More information that we have will allow us to conduct our searches and as a search locations in terms of where we where she's possibly located. The search is expected to continue until nightfall and even overnight in a limited capacity. Paul Palmiter, CBC News, Mount William. Some early childhood educators in Nova Scotia say they don't have enough training to give kids with disabilities proper care. ECE certification typically requires a two-year diploma, but people working in the sector say more disability-related education should be incorporated into these programs. Selena Alders reports. Jenna LeBlanc thought she would be fully equipped to enter the child care sector when she earned her ECE diploma in 2018. But when she started in the field, she quickly realized she had a lot more to learn. Her first encounter with a child that needed one-on-one -on -one support was with a young girl who has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair. That was incredibly hard to navigate because um, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> that sounds horrible, but... LeBlanc says her program touched on some intellectual disabilities, but that she received no hands-on training for physical disabilities. Beth Towler is the executive director of We Care Developmental Centre, one of the province's leading inclusive childcare facilities. She says a lack of resources and training for ECEs are the biggest barriers when it comes to creating more childcare spaces for kids who require specialized care. If that training was there for, you know, the proper specific training, then all centres would be able to accommodate these children. The Department of Education says post-secondary programs are meant to help students develop an understanding of disabilities and inclusion. The department also offers a series of professional development training modules that ECEs can take if they want to further their skills. An updated version of the early learning curriculum framework is set to be released sometime this spring. Blair Hill is a facilitator for these modules and an ECE instructor at NSCC in Sydney. He says workshops specializing in disabilities are highly sought after. That's one of the, the top topics that, that staff will look for because they need more resources and they, they're looking for other strategies that they can use to help support these children. 
As for LeBlanc, she's done plenty of professional development. I remember doing a two-day workshop it was specifically on autism and how to support children with autism. It was great. <clears throat> but again, there's a huge, huge gap on what to do when a child's physically disabled. She and others in the field say that ECEs should be getting that training when they start their education so that they can ensure all kids are getting the support they need and deserve. Selena Alders, CBC News, Halifax. A Nova Scotia dentist is calling on others in his profession to enroll in the new National Dental Care Plan. Only four dentists across the province have signed up. Dr. Brandon Doucette is one of them. He says he believes the plan is ultimately fair for dentists and equates his colleagues' opposition to it to when doctors were initially against Medicare decades ago. Part of this is driven by a distrust between dentists and governments because many of the provincial programs are so meager. But there is also just an ideological problem here where a lot of dentists just don't want public dental care. Uh, and I, I differ from them in this sense. I think public dental care is a great thing. I think if we look at the way Medicare has been rolled out, doctors are still the highest in income earners in the country. And I think dentists are being treated very, very fairly under this plan. And I think, you know, I, I'm very disappointed in how my colleagues are acting in the rollout of this program. I'll talk to Dr. Doucette about why he thinks fellow dentists should provide dental services as part of the troubled national plan. That's our newsmaker just after 6.30. Dangerous and unsightly properties are a big problem in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Council says they don't have the money to clean them up and are asking the province for help footing the bill. Kyle Moore explains. It's been almost 12 years since this former post office in North Sydney closed its doors. Since then, the local councillor says it's been a place used for vandals and drug use. When staff was trying to board up the building, we had to call the police because the people that were, we didn't know there was people inside, but there was people inside, and they decided that they were going to start throwing debris at the staff members, rocks, glass, anything they could get. The vandalism has made its way across the street to Branch 19 Legion. The president says vehicles have been keyed and windows smashed by people staying in the abandoned building. We've had to install a, a, a buzzer system to make sure that uh, people that are coming in uh, are, are members or we know them. It's also keeping people away from the downtown core. North Sydney is a gateway to Newfoundland and sees tourists pass through the area daily. It's not representing what we, who we truly are, what we, um, um, what we want from our community. People are walking the streets, you know, when they're, they sometimes have seven or eight hours layover. The municipality currently has 400 dangerous and unsightly properties in need of work. The annual budget for that is $120,000, which helps remove 16 a year from the list. But the list keeps growing as more keep cropping up. CBRM Council is asking the provincial government for a million dollars a year over the next three years to help clean up derelict properties. I'm worried about people's health. You know, kids are getting into the building daily, which you'll hear. Um, we have people that, you know, they experience homelessness. I'm afraid that they're in there. It's not healthy. It's not safe. The residents aren't safe around it. The Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing says they have not yet received a request from the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, but if they do, they will review it. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Sydney. Now, I realize that what most Canadians want to know is when are we going to lower our policy rate? What do we need to see to be convinced to cut? The short answer is we are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that the progress towards price stability will be sustained. Most analysts expect to see the rate cut at the bank's next setting in June. Headline inflation is now at 2.8 percent and is being held there by high housing costs and rising gasoline prices. There. Better late than never, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sunny day out there. Nice to have you here to talk all about it. Yeah, beautiful. It feels springish. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, feeling a lot like spring out there. The sun really helps uh, this time of year. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Tom and Amy. And yeah, we cracked the double digits in a couple of spots today. That sun uh, starting to uh, fade away in through western areas where the clouds have been building in. Let's take a quick look at those highs today. We did hit double digits from the airport back into the Annapolis Valley and down towards the Kedgy area. That was our hot spot at 12 degrees. A little cooler in those onshore southerly winds and through Cape Breton as well. And as we look at the satellite radar picture, you can see lots of clear skies hanging on in the east. That cloud cover building in in the west as this area of high pressure moves to the east. That is going to allow this moisture to eventually work its way in. But it's going to take some time because this is pretty dry air set up over top of us right now. This is the next system we're going to be watching right here. Some showers ahead of it, but some steadier rain arriving with that system that's just developing now along the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So for tomorrow, pretty similar temperature wise, high single digits, some low double digits. The best chance of double digits is going to be here in the northeast, actually, where we have a little more sunshine and those southerly winds are going to help to bump temperatures up uh, and a little milder through Cape Breton tomorrow. Note the winds. Yes, from the south, we'll see some gusts upwards of 50, even 60 kilometers per hour in through the southwest, especially late tomorrow as that system really starts to work its way in. So there are those isolated shower chances for tomorrow. Again, far from a washout, but just keep the umbrella handy. Dry in the east, and then we'll see those periods of rain starting to work their way in for Friday. Some gusty winds with this as well. Maybe even the risk of a rumble of thunder, especially later Friday into Friday night. And then for Saturday, some lingering showers. But yeah, a couple of sun breaks in there as well. Not a washout this weekend. Either Tom and Amy will walk you through it with your full seven day forecast coming up in a few minutes. We'll take the, the sun, sun when we breaks. can get it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Well, there's a growing call to reinstate the lucrative elver or baby eel fishery, which is currently on pause in the Maritimes. As the CBC's Kayla Hounsel shows us, the heated issue has led to threats and arrests, but some are still fishing anyways. They might make you a little squeamish, and they're causing a lot of controversy. So what would normally be happening here right now? Normally all these tanks here would be set up across the plant, and they'd be full of water and hopefully eels. But this elver or baby eel plant has been shut down. Actually, the federal government shut down the entire elver fishery, citing safety and sustainability concerns. There have been accounts of death threats, organized crime, and illegal fishing. Still, Zachary Townsend has started a petition calling on the government to reopen the fishery. We feel that we are being unfairly punished for DFO's mismanagement of this fishery. Baby eels from rivers like this one are sold to Asia, where they're grown to maturity, grilled and eaten. The dish is so popular it led to overfishing in Japan and Europe, leaving seafood wholesalers looking to Canada. Elvers are now Canada's most valuable seafood by weight, worth nearly $5,000 a kilogram. By comparison, lobster is worth around $15 a kilogram. Fisheries officers have arrested 70 people for fishing elvers since the season was cancelled a month ago. I'm glad they've got that many people, but honestly, it's just a drop in the bucket. This licensed dealer is out of work and frustrated with unauthorized fishers. It's anybody that has the ambition to do it. And it doesn't take much, right? Nope. You need a dip net and a bucket and you're all set. Some indigenous people admit they're fishing unauthorized. We are allowed to fish anywhere we want. Last week, dozens protested after two Mi'kmaq fishers were arrested. I'm just practicing my treaty rights and hunting fish and fishing. A 1999 Supreme Court of Canada decision did reaffirm the treaty right to fish, but also says the government has a right to regulate that fishery. I think that would be a gray area, but I think the first step to that would be for DFO for Canada to come to the Mi'kmaq chiefs. Canada's fisheries minister declined an interview, but says she has now met with Mi'kmaq leaders. My whole livelihood is based on this fishery. Townsend says there is still time for the government to let licensed fishers catch baby eels this year. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Nearly 1,000 fishermen in Canada's biggest lobster fishing district will vote this spring on whether to increase the minimum legal size of lobster they catch. Harvester, harvesters in lobster fishing area 34 in southwestern Nova Scotia will decide if they will match an increase coming south of the border. 
The American size increase was automatically triggered by surveys in the Gulf of Maine showing declines in young lobster. At stake is maintaining access to the United States market. Heather Mullick is with the Coldwater Lobster Association. So what we did, we looked at a 10-year average to see what percentage of their catch would be impacted. So if license holders in LFA 34 voted today that they would match that first uh, increment from 82.5 to 84 millimeters, it would uh, affect approximately 11 to 15 percent of their catch. And the lobsters that they would throw back into the water that particular year, they would be um, large enough to be caught that following season, that next December. But for LFA 34, which is the largest lobster fishing area in Canada, 979 license license holders, we are a live market. We do have to look at this and take it uh, seriously. 39% of our market is the U.S. for Canadian uh, lobster, so it's something we have to look at. But it's not an easy decision. The vote in LFA 34 is expected in late May or early June. A spokesperson for St. Mary's University says the university is willing to take action to make sure the school is economically sustainable. It comes amid a call for the resignation of the school's president and board of governors by faculty members. The union that represents nearly 300 staff members voted overwhelmingly in support of a no-confidence motion. The CBC's Brett Ruskin has the latest. St. Mary's University, or SMU, is the third largest university by enrollment in Nova Scotia, behind Dalhousie and Cape Breton University. But faculty members there are not happy with the way that things are being run. A new poll by the union, uh, polling its union members, found that 91% of faculty memberships uh, in this union say that they have no confidence in the president and the leadership of the university. They say that debt is up, enrollment is down. There are issues with how the university is being run. Now, what do the results of this poll mean? Well, not very much automatically. There's nothing binding. There's nothing enforceable about this vote, but it is the latest message, the latest effort that the union is taking to share their thoughts on the current situation facing the university as a whole. So the university on their part say uh, they want to work, they're, they're listening, they're hearing the thoughts from faculty members and union representation. They want to work closely, amicably with union leadership uh, and that they want to ensure that the university is sustainable going forward in the future. The union is currently still pressing forward on this, calling for change. They'll be hosting an information event tomorrow afternoon just on the sidewalk outside the university with faculty members as well as members of the public to can share more information about the situation at SMU. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Oromocto, New Brunswick. Well, Halifax is set to welcome a new sports team. A new professional women's soccer club will take the field next year. According to their website, the Atlantic Women's Football Club is building a team that will compete in a new Canadian professional women's soccer league. The founding clubs will be located in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto and Halifax. Former Canadian women's national team player Diana Matheson co-founded the new league. The club says its official name and branding will be unveiled soon. Halifax is already home to the CPL's Halifax Wanderers. More the merrier, I would say. That's right. That's it, our first quick break on the way. Stay with us. We have a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau testifies at the inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian elections. After a warm winter, Canadian officials are bracing for a repeat of last year's record-breaking wildfire season. And there's a live look over Halifax Harbour this evening. We've got Ryan back next with his forecast. We'll see you after the break.
All right, maybe we're getting spoiled with the sun. Another day of it and, and a lovely evening as and, well. And the light just keeps getting longer and longer. And longer. longer. I, I love these days. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, you're surprised. Oh, it's still light out. And, uh, <laughs> for sure, the the, uh, the sun is, uh, the clouds are building in. Sun is hanging on, mm. uh, but it uh, will hang on a little, even a little bit longer for eastern areas of tomorrow, including beautiful Shearbrook. And that's where we're going to start. <sighs> What a spot that is. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful shot, uh, again, courtesy of Nova Scotia webcams. And lots of sunshine there. Just on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that little white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that is some of the very high cloud cover that Cirrus Cloud starting to work its way in. Uh, five degrees, though, and uh, lots of sunshine in Sherbrooke right now. Uh, temperatures uh, right around that five, six degree mark, four, five, six degrees along that Atlantic coastline. And those temperatures... Uh, Definitely a little milder inland, still hanging on to the double digits at Kedgie and uh, high single digits for most of the rest of the north, though a little cool again in Cape Breton today. Your temperatures on the island, though, will pop tomorrow, uh, thankfully, as the winds will round to the south. Now you can see those current winds uh, as of right now. Again, they've been quite variable today. They've started coming in from the south uh, for the western parts of the province and then into Halifax. Uh, still hanging on to a bit of a northerly component to the air uh, for to those winds uh, for Cape Breton. Uh, not too gusty out there, just uh, kind of steady. Now, you can see that cloud cover starting to work its way in. And yes, uh, this is the infrared satellite as we back things out. There are those showers that are going to try to march into the region for tonight and tomorrow, and they will do so, but they're going to be fairly isolated and uh, not, uh, nothing to be too concerned about. This is the system that we're going to be watching that's further off to the south and west in through the Gulf of Mexico, and this is bringing some heavy rain uh, to the U.S. south. Now, it will be modified by the time it gets to us. Uh, well, we will have to watch for some the potential for some heavier rains over eastern parts of the mainland, uh, but uh, overall uh, it will be just a solid soaking that comes and goes, which is what we want to see this time of year. At uh, 13 in Vancouver right now, you can see high single low double digits in through most of the prairies, 15 in Winnipeg, 18 degrees in through Toronto. Now, as we look at the temperatures for tonight, quite variable again. The north and east where the skies are mostly clear, we're going to be dropping into the minus four, minus six, minus seven, even minus eight range across Cape Breton Island. And then as you work your way west into the southerly flow and yes, the potential uh, for some showers and even a few flakes mixing in through the overnight with those clouds, temperatures are going to be milder. And you can see there are those few wet flakes, the potential for those overnight tonight into tomorrow morning in that cloud deck making its way as far as the Northumberland and Eastern Shore. Cape Breton, sunshine throughout the day tomorrow. That Northumberland Shore and Eastern Shore will be about a mix of sun and cloud. And then Truro to Halifax and kind of west of that line, mainly cloudy. Uh, some sunny breaks possible for central areas tomorrow. Pretty cloud capped. Uh, in through the Tri-County area, and that's where we will have our best chance of showers, but even there, uh, they will be isolated. Uh, temperatures 5 to 7, 8, 9, possibly even 10 degrees for parts of Inverness County tomorrow. Uh, the best chances of that is going to be down towards the Port Hood area and then into Anaganish. New Glasgow, Tatamagush, beautiful day there. Sherbrooke and uh, through the Eastern Shore, nice day as well. Again, clouds thicker here in through the west. Chance for isolated showers, Kentville back towards Annapolis Royal, Digby, Yarmouth, Shelburne, some uh, better chance for showers here through the Tri-County area. Double ditch potential for Kedgie, but with the clouds, the shower chances, and that onshore flow, temperatures will again be cooler right along the coastline. Halifax will range from around 6 along the coast to 8 to 10 degrees for inland areas for tomorrow. Milder for Friday, no doubt, but fog patches and periods of rain and drizzle, even the risk of a rumble of thunder on Friday. Widespread double digits and yes, even some teens, maybe 15 or 16 degrees in through the Annapolis Valley. So it looks like a band of scattered showers for Thursday night, early Friday, then some steadier periods of rain marching in throughout the afternoon. And again, that risk of a rumble of thunder. Note these arrows that are moving a little faster and f some of these orange colors. These are some stronger wind gusts, uh, which look more likely for Friday night into Saturday morning as this uh, line finally works its way out and there are those sunny breaks that we talked about uh, in the first hit which we are looking at the potential for those to move in for saturday afternoon kind of a widespread 10 to 30 millimeters looking most likely highest amounts in through the south and these are totals through saturday thursday night through saturday and it's that eastern shore into cape breton where we could creep into some 30 40 50 millimeter amounts uh, with locally heavier pockets most likely there so keeping an eye on that 
As we said, some sunny breaks both Saturday and Sunday, but we'll keep the umbrella handy through this weekend. The good news is Tom and Amy again, those temperatures looking fairly mild through the next mm -hmm. seven. <laughs> that is the good news. Stay so. mild. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Thank Ryan. Up next, I'll talk with a Nova Scotia dentist, one of the few who is signing on to the new dental care, the National Dental Care Plan, about why he thinks other reluctant dentists are wrong. That's our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News. The National Dental Care Plan starts next month, but almost all dentists in Nova Scotia are reluctant to participate, citing issues with billing and staffing shortages in some locations. The local association says only four dentists in the entire province have signed on to the program that is supposed to start providing care for seniors and eventually low- and middle-income Canadians who don't have private coverage. Dr. Brandon Doucette is a dentist based in Nova Scotia doing a lot of work out of the Spring Hill Institution and he has signed up for the program. Dr. Doucette, why did you sign up when almost all of your colleagues in Nova Scotia, we are told at least by the Dental Association, have not? Fundamentally, I think dental care is health care. Uh, I think everyone deserves access to care. Now, this takes responsibility from both the government and 
uh, from the dental professionals. From my perspective, uh, I think the government's done a very reasonable job at giving dentists what they want in this plan. First of all, uh, they respected dentists' uh, desire to have this in a private practice fee-for-service model, which is the way dentistry normally acts here in Canada, and that remains the same. Um, the Nova Scotia Dental Association last week said to dentists that the fees the program pay out are around 88.7% of what the Nova Scotia Dental Association fee guide recommends. Uh, and if we're comparing ourselves to other provincial dental programs, they often pay around half of what the fee guide suggests. So this is far, far more. And dentists are actually allowed to balance bill the difference so they can charge their regular fees. The coverage under this plan is far more comprehensive than the existing provincial dental programs that often only focus on emergency procedures. This is far more comprehensive. I still think we have a lot of work left to do to make sure that, you know, Dental care is really being treated as health care, but this is the largest investment in dental care in Canadian history, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. Okay, you're one of only four in the province, dentists that is, that have signed up for this. The, the Dental Association told us yesterday, and others across the country are echoing this, that they, are, they have concerns about lack of information around the program, a lack of consultation with dentists, and frankly, a lack of staff to do the additional work that would come with the program. What do you make of those concerns? Uh, so the lack of inf there is plenty of information available on the government websites. Dentists have been con consulted throughout this process, despite the dental association saying otherwise. Uh, I do think it's important we keep in mind that dentists have largely never wanted public dental care. There are exceptions like myself. Uh, but if we look back in history, say in the 1980s in Saskatchewan, there was a very successful children's dental program that organized dentistry fought tooth and nail to dismantle. And, you know, children's oral health in the province has suffered as a result. I do think now we're seeing a repeat of history in this sense. It's similar to the doctors being opposed to Medicare. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, Part of this is driven by a distrust between dentists and governments because many of the provincial programs are so meager. But there is also just an ideological problem here where a lot of dentists just don't want public dental care. Uh, and I, I differ from them in this sense. I think public dental care is a great thing. I think if we look at the way Medicare has been rolled out, doctors are still the highest in income earners in the country. And I think dentists are being treated very, very fairly under this plan. And I think, you know, I, I'm very disappointed in how my colleagues are acting in the rollout of this program because I think it's very fair to dentists. Okay, let me ask and, you about that. What, what does that say? What does that say then about dentists in this province and other parts of the country who are smart people? who I don't think would want to be admitting to being led around by the nose at all, uh, if they're ultimately deciding not to go this route. I mean, is it a money issue? Is it just that 12% difference that you're saying that uh, the program would not uh, pay them for? Well, it's important to remember, they can balance bill the difference in that 12%, so they're not losing any money. It's unfortunate from my perspective with that because patients have to pay the money, and I don't think they should have to. Um, but they're, like dentists are not losing any money with this plan. I don't think there's an unreasonable administrative burden like a lot of dentists are claiming. And to be honest with you, I've just seen a lot of misinformation from dentists, from dental associations on this. Some of this, I'm sure, is you know people just not knowing. But I do think some of it may be intentional. Uh, and the unfortunate reality, if we look at the politics of this program, a lot of uh, the dental associations, what they're saying is this plan's being rushed and we need to delay it so that we can get it right. The reality of what they're trying to say there is that we need to wait until the next after the next election at a federal level. And they know the polling is showing a conservative majority. So they know if it doesn't this plan doesn't become a success mm -hmm. before then, it's going to be much easier to take away that dental care from eight and a half million people, whether that's, you know, in one fell swoop or the death by a thousand cuts okay. met. Yeah. Uh, ways that's happened with a lot of the existing public dental plans, but it's something, this is very fair to dentists. Dentists have released policy papers, like the Canadian Dental Associations, of what they would want from a public dental plan. D dentists have almost gotten everything that they want. So, you know, I, I, I just think that they're, this is history repeating itself with the, you know, doctors being opposed to Medicare. 
dentists dismantled the most successful children's dental program in North American history. You know, history is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, as you say, the clock is ticking on this. The concerns of it, a federal election might change things. Uh, we heard dentists uh, saying that their staff didn't want to take on this work because it's millions of more patients across the country eventually, and how would they get ready for that, and so on. You do a lot of work in the public institution. Just before I let you go, if you owned a big private practice with all the overhead and so on, might you feel differently about this? Uh, so I don't think there's going to be any more administrative burden than there would be if for somebody with private insurance, which, you know, you already have to fill out some paperwork on occasion. I don't think it's going to be any different with this plan than private plans. There's a hesitation from dentists because some of the existing public plans are so meager that, uh, you know, they worry about the added administrative burden and also that it's going to take them a long time to get paid. But it actually says in the Sun Life contract that the payout period is going to be within 48 hours of when you bill the procedure. Uh, so, you know, that's a very quick turnaround time. And uh, I don't think the you know, uh, along with, you know, say if you have to fill out a piece of paperwork once in a while, you're also going to get paid more money because these are millions of patients who were not able to pay for care before who are now mm -hmm. able to. And from my perspective as well, I've seen dozens of people in the five years since graduating who have tried to extract their own teeth since because they're in such bad dental pain. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a bigger problem than having to fill out a form once in a while. Dr. Doucette, we'll leave it on that point. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Coming up, Boeing is called to address new whistleblower allegations of safety issues with some of the company's aircrafts.
After days of testimony from security agencies and senior government officials, the public inquiry into foreign interference in Canada's elections heard from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Trudeau and members of his cabinet testified about what they knew about allegations of election meddling by China and what the government did to fight it. Kate McKenna reports from Ottawa. In the finale of this chapter of the inquiry, the Prime Minister and three cabinet ministers were pushed on what they knew about foreign meddling and when. I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly through diasporas, uh, can take an interest in Canadian political processes. Minister Karina Gould was the architect of the government's plan to stop foreign interference. She defended it today. Probably in every election that Canada has ever had, there have been attempts at foreign interference, just like in probably every election in a democracy around the world, probably since ancient Greece. The question is whether that interference is successful. Gould acknowledges she was told about low-level intelligence of Chinese meddling in the 2019 election, but says an appointed panel was right not to sound the alarm. Intelligence is not evidence. They need to be certain if they're going to suggest something. Uh, because again, the very act of suggesting or making a public declaration will have an impact on the outcome of the election. Minister Bill Blair was briefed about possible Chinese meddling in the 2019 Liberal nomination of Han Dong. He says he pressed Canada's spy agency for more details, but they came back empty-handed. They indicated to me that they did not at that time have um, other corroborating evidence to, to in, in any way to substantiate that. Minister Dominic Leblanc says he was briefed after the 2019 election and was told the system worked. Some of the most senior intelligence and security officials in the country confirmed to me their view uh, that the 2019 election was free and fair and that any attempts at foreign interference would not have uh, affected the outcome of the election, uh, including in specific in individual riding. Later this week, the Commission is set to hear from the head of CSIS for a second time. The Commission is set to file its report in early May. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government is bracing for a repeat of last year's devastating and record-breaking wildfire season. Today, several cabinet ministers unveiled Ottawa's plans to prepare for the worst. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has the details. It is getting warm outside across much of the country. Whatever snow fell has melted or is melting, and federal ministers sound nervous. We can expect that the wildfire season will start sooner and end later and potentially be more explosive. This is what officials are worried about, a repeat of last year. Eight firefighters died, 15 million hectares burned. That's seven times the annual average. Smoke blanketed the continent. The entire city of Yellowknife forced to flee. This is what conditions look like now, dry across much of the country. Extreme drought conditions in parts of Alberta, the Northwest Territories and BC. Just how dry? Check out this riverbed in Prince George, British Columbia. Adding to the risk, predictions of above normal temperatures in the weeks and months to come. This is really an all hands on deck moment. This is not, uh, this is not something that any level of government can address on its own. First Nations are especially vulnerable. Training programs and additional staff are helping many communities prepare. If we have persistent dry weather and no precipitation, yeah, then I'll, I'll, I'll get nervous. Um, and for me, the biggest thing is to have my crews ready to go. And ahead of next week's budget, the federal government announced it is doubling the tax credit for volunteer firefighters to $6,000. Potentially more cash for those on the front lines. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. U.S. President Joe Biden has leveled more criticism at Israel's prime minister. In a television interview, he called Benjamin Netanyahu's approach on Gaza a mistake. Biden called for an immediate ceasefire and the free flow of aid. Allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. I've spoken with everyone from the Saudis to the Jordanians, to the Egyptians, they're prepared to move in. They're prepared to move this food in. And I think there's, there, there, there's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. They should be done now. 
Biden called the deadly airstrike on World Central Kitchen aid workers outrageous. He has been an outspoken supporter of Israel's war against Hamas, but in recent weeks, his administration has taken a tougher stance. Six former Mississippi law enforcement officers were handed sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years in state court today. They pleaded guilty to the torture and abuse of two black men in January of 2023. The lawyer from one of the victims shared his client's victim impact statement. They did some unimaginable things to me and the effects of it will last on my life forever. All six of the former officers pleaded guilty to state charges of obstruction of justice and conspiracy to hinder prosecution. The former lawman admitted to breaking into a home without a warrant and torturing Eddie Parker and Michael Jenkins in an hours-long attack. It included beatings, the use of stun guns and assaults with sex objects. The ex-officers had already been sentenced to federal pr prison in March and pleaded guilty to a long list of state and federal charges. Terms ranged from 10 to 40 years. State and federal sentences will run con concurrently. There are new concerns about the safety of Boeing airliners. A whistleblower claims there are construction flaws in the 777 and 787 passenger jets. It is the latest in a growing list of concerns about Boeing aircraft. And for the second time this year, the head of the company is being called to appear in front of U.S. lawmakers. The CBC's Cameron McIntosh has that story. They're among the top-selling wide-bodied jets in the world. Boeing's 777 and 787 Dreamliner. Manufacturing processes for both now being investigated by the Federal Aviation Administration. I am hopeful that the FAA will not allow this to go unanswered. Boeing engineer Sam Salafor alleging the 777 could have damaged parts. That changes to manufacturing of 787s could leave fuselages with improperly closed gaps. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. You certainly don't see that in Boeing's corporate videos. Boeing denies Salifer's allegations, along with allegations from his lawyer. He was threatened with physical violence. He was threatened with termination. Salifer worked in the same South Carolina plant as another whistleblower, John Barnett, who also raised concerns about the 787. He was found dead in his truck in March of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Boeing, meanwhile, is reeling from recent mid-flight scares. A 737-800 engine cover falling off just this week. A 757-200 suffering wing damage in February. And that 737 MAX 9 losing a door plug in January. The largest aircraft builder in the world, orders were up last month despite its troubles, which have slowed production schedules. And it's probably going to take a long time for them to get out of this because, again, you have to change the culture and they have to go back to a more safety-oriented culture. Boeing's CEO has announced his retirement later this year. Salifer has been invited to testify in Washington next week. I'm doing this not because I want Boeing to fail, but because I want, I want it to succeed and prevent the crashes from happening. Although there is an investigation, neither of the planes have been grounded. Boeing insisting it always works with regulators. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. This week's solar eclipse had a lot of people looking skyward, but a unique observatory in B.C. uses sound, not sight, to observe the sun. Camille Vernet has more. Nested in an Okanagan Valley, far from urban interferences, the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory is the only one in the country doing radio astronomy. It's here where they gather the radio waves of the solar system and listen to the stars. And as stars go, none are more important than the sun. The one that measures the solar flux is the one over there. The tiny one? The tiny one. These two dishes might be small, but they're very important, according to astronomer Andrew Gray. We're observing the nearest star. The other stars are all light years away. The sun is light minutes away, so it has a much bigger impact on the Earth than any other object in the universe. So when the sun hiccups, we want to know about it. Because sometimes the sun gets a little feisty. What we call a solar flare, a large release of energy on the surface of the sun. And those flares are often accompanied by an ejection of matter. 
if that matter crosses the Earth's orbit at the same time that the Earth is there, it has a huge impact on the Earth. This impact is called a solar storm, and it can damage satellites, power lines and navigation systems. This is a record of a coronal mass ejection event in 1989 that caused a power outage in Quebec. You can see the amplitudes here are enormous. But most of the time, the sun is actually rather quiet. So what you want to know is, why is this uninteresting? <laughs> it's good news that there are no flares. This is the entire data set from 1947 to the current day of every measurement made with this experiment. It's the longest continuous record of solar radio emissions anywhere in the world. Historic and rich data that is widely used in the scientific community. In Saskatoon, Catherine McWilliams is researching the impact of solar storms on the upper atmosphere. Having these really long data sets are really nice to try to establish patterns and see how the behavior is common over a large number of events. And space weather centers around the world are using the information coming from Penticton to predict solar storms. The radio waves don't care if it's cloudy. We don't rely on counting sunspots or other means of measuring solar activity that relies on being able to see the sun. And this is important for understanding future behavior of the sun. From sunrise to sunset, they track the sun because listening in to the sun today helps predict its future. Camille Verne, CBC News, Penticton. Losses in financial and utility stocks helped drag Canada's main stock index down today, while U.S. markets also fell. Here's a look at the numbers.
So we could have heard the eclipse. Oh, from that perhaps. story, yes, yeah, yeah, from yeah, that really. previous story. Mm -hmm. That would have been interesting. It would have. I liked but... seeing it a lot better. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a bit cooler. <laughs> you know, I think the the visual aspect yeah. of the eclipse is certainly the one mm -hmm. that most folks appreciate yes. for sure. And it's funny, I've been hearing uh, from uh, some of our colleagues who were lucky enough to get to New Brunswick and, uh, mm -hmm. and experience totality, how cool that was. It's pretty cool here across Nova Scotia, too. <laughs> and again, another one of these photos not looking up, but looking elsewhere. Uh, have a look at this picture. This was taken in Halifax. And this one, uh, yeah, beautiful shot that shows. Oh, nice. Again. Not a regular looking shadow, right? Just you can see the, especially on the little branches, how that lo just looks a little bit different given the sun, again, is uh, so much of it was obscured by the moon. So pretty cool shot there. The other notable thing here is the grass so green, green in that picture, Judy. Yeah, <laughs> whatever you're feeding that lawn, Judy, it's uh, looking good. Uh, as uh, the grass will continue to green up as those temperatures continue to warm up over the next few days. Uh, 7 to 10 degrees across the province for tomorrow. Again, uh, brighter for Cape Breton, the Northumberland shore, and the eastern shore. That's where we'll be into a mix of sun and cloud. Cloudier and uh, shower chances increase as you move west. We're all into the wet weather for Friday, periods of rain. We're looking at temperatures ranging between 10 and 15 degrees, though I do think based on what we were seeing today and the model data that, uh, you know, the valley could see maybe 16, 17 mm, degrees nice. on Friday afternoon, though it is going to be pretty wet <laughs> as we will be watching again. There are those showers that try to move in. That high pressure area kind of shuts those that first wave down. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's no stopping it uh, as it really starts to work in uh, with that wettest weather for Friday into Friday night. And we'll run you right through to show you those potential sunny breaks mm -hmm. Saturday. Stay tuned. All right, thanks, Ryan. Well, there was a little bit of horsing around at a train station near Sydney, Australia recently. Yes, this runaway racehorse startled commuters when it turned up at a busy rail station. Oh dear. The crafty animal had somehow navigated a set of stairs to get to the platform. <laughs> it was sensible enough to obey the rules and stand behind the yellow safety line as trains approached. The equine uh, had uh, bolted from uh, a nearby stable yard when it, uh, where it lived after an intruder broke in. Oh it was eventually captured by a staff member and returned home safely. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Ah, happy ending. All right, that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.